I feel humbled and honored to be able to speak to you tonight about my favorite subject, mathematics. When I first heard the phrase square one, I thought, wow, what a simple yet powerful phrase that is. What does it mean to me? And I thought immediately of infinity. And I, th I thought, well, let me imagine a time when man was around and he had to come up with some idea of a unit of measure. That unit could have been pretty much anything. It could have been a foot. <laughs> it could have been a, sh a sheep. It doesn't really matter. But the fascinating part is that those units could be combined in some way or divided into parts. So I thought, well, if I start with a square, because this is square one, and I just keep adding squares, if I could do it forever, I would have a picture of what infinity would look like. Of course, the idea with numbers is a number can be easily split into parts. Two parts, four parts, eight parts. Oh, why not go to infinite number of parts? And the sum of the parts is always one. That's pretty powerful. Of course, I can't um, take credit for it. This is the notation that we actually would use in a math class, if I throw that in a little bit. But my great man, Archimedes. Archimedes was a famous mathematician. You can see he was born in 287 BC and died at the hands of a Roman soldier in 212 BC. The story of his death goes something like this. The soldier's orders were to capture Archimedes. I mean, he was a genius. So they you know, ran into his home, there was chaos. Archimedes was so engrossed in his mathematics that there was, he didn't even notice until a soldier finally says, what's your name? And all Archimedes could think of saying is, don't touch my circles. So I'm sure the soldier thought, well, this is just some crazy old man, and he kills him. But Archimedes you know, dies for his love of mathematics, but he leaves us with new ideas. And one of his ideas, was basically to uh, the number pi, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of the circle. His problem that he wanted to solve was how to come up with a formula for the circumference of the circle, which we know is 2 pi r. So he decided, wait, I'll divide it into parts. I'll divide it into six parts, creating a hexagon inside and outside of the circle. Then I'll calculate the perimeters of those hexagons. And that'll give me an approximation for the circumference. So if you assume that the um, radius of the circle is 1, then the, the perimeter of the inscribed hexagon would be 6, and the circumscribed hexagon would be around 7. So the average would be 6.5. And, and if you actually used your formula 2 pi r, you'd find out it was about 6.28. Close. Well. Why six? Let's go ahead and do 12 sides, he says. So I'll divide the uh, circle into 12 parts, inscribing a 12-sided polygon inside, and then circumscribing a, the 12-sided polygon on the outside. I'll get a closer approximation of the circumference. Why not 24? So here we go. Now you start to see that when you put in 24 sides, you have a 24-sided figure on the inside, 24-sided figure on the outside, it starts to look like the circle. The polygon looks like the circle, and now you know you're getting closer to the actual circumference. Well, of course, you know, Archimedes did not stop at 24. He actually went up to 96 sides. Now you know why he didn't want them to touch those circles. Because that's a lot of work. So here we go. He says, oh, well, I want 96 sides. He inscribes 96-sided polygons, circumscribes the 96-sided polygon, comes up with a couple of numbers. So the numbers that he actually comes up with uh, is 3 and 1 seventh, and 3 and 10 over 71. And the number we know and love today, pi, does fit in between. If students use their calculator, they would get that value for pi, and the average of Archimedes' two numbers is almost the same thing. Pretty darn good. What you have to know, though, is in Archimedes' days, the decimal was not around. There was no decimal numbers. The second thing in Archimedes' days is the pi, the symbol that we use for circumference divided by diameter, did not make its way into the math world until about 1706. And then the third thing you have to know is that the math world shunned the idea of infinity. 
So it wasn't until the past century that infinity was finally accepted by mathematicians as a value worth looking at. So he couldn't go to infinity. He wasn't really allowed. It wasn't part of their thought. But you know what? We can. So here we go. In a calculus class, then what it would look like is this limit problem. We'd let the number of sides go to infinity and actually prove that the circumference of the circle is exactly 2 pi r. Pretty good. The idea of being able to expand and go to infinity lends itself now to a new area of mathematics, well, relatively new, called fractals. What is a fractal? A fractal is any object or quantity that has this self-similarity feature. By that I mean, if you look at any one part of the, f of the object, you see the whole object. Here is a picture of Sierpinski's triangle. It's a geometric fractal. The way the triangle is constructed is we start with an equilateral triangle, connect the midpoints of the sides, create more triangles. And then we pretty much repeat the process, creating more triangles, creating more triangles, until we either are tired of creating triangles or we get pictures like this. Zooming in on any part of Sierpinski's triangle looks like the whole triangle. Now, this idea of this self-similarity actually makes its way into nature. When we look at different things, they have the self-similarity. The fern leaf. Look at the big fern leaf, look at the little piece of it, and you will see that it's very similar. Of course, we all know and love broccoli. Broccoli is the same thing. You look at a big head of broccoli, the flowerettes look very similar. So here we um, have lightning. That's another fractal. So the mathematics is really all around us. We just need to know what we're looking at. Fractals. All right, so comes along this guy named Mandelbrot. Nineteen, late 1960s, he uncovers this idea of fractals. And I say uncovers because really credit should go to uh, Georg Cantor, a German mathematician, um, who really introduced the first fractal, which we call the Cantor set. He revolutionized mathematics with his set theory, and he tried to get the math community to accept infinity. He went into the insane asylum because they didn't want infinity at that point. So here we, poor guy. He, but he got Mendelbrot thinking. Mendelbrot, in the late 60s, computer science, uh, computers were coming out. So he, he thought, I wonder if I could get a computer to simulate fractals. So he hooks up with a computer programmer. They design some program, and he designs the, a fractal called the Mendelbrot set. Now, what's when you look at the picture, I mean, I know when I looked at the picture, the first thing I thought is no human hand drew that. One. Two, when you look at the mathematical equation used to draw the picture, it's a rather simple equation. It's a quadratic equation that we cover in most of our Algebra two classes. The simple is defining the complex, in my opinion. So when I see that equation, I think, wow, what looks hard isn't really. It's just a matter of what to know what I'm looking at. So the Mendelbrot said, if you look at, um, it should go into a video, but I guess I missed that. Uh, it had just zooming features, so you could see the self-similarity idea. Um, the Julia set, same kind of thing. Notice that the equation is the same. They just change and manipulate the types of numbers they put in. Well, that's a pretty cool idea to get a computer to generate pictures. And once uh, the human brain gets a hold of things and it lets go of their imagination, they suddenly come up with what we call fractal art. If you go on the internet today, you will see oodles and oodles of fractal art. It's beautiful. Computer, program, software, and some mathematical equations create visions that are spectacular. I hope that I've managed to share with you that the simple is square one. The result is a structure, a complicated structure without bound. That you see the beauty in the mathematics and the connection between square one and infinity. I know infinity is a tough idea to wrap our heads around because it seems we live in a limited world. The question I ask myself, is the world really finite or is it my limited knowledge that makes it so? Thank you very much.